Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 CCCS Constitutional Law Conference. I'm Adrienne Stone, who, along with um, Jason Vruis, I'm Director of the Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the Melbourne Law School and the Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies are on the land, the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and I pay our respects to their elders past and present. And I also acknowledge that I am speaking to you today from the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. This is a regular event that has been held every two or three years since 2009, and this is now the seventh CCCS Constitutional Law Conference. And over the years, we have had many of you come uh, very regularly, and it's so pleasing to see many long-term friends of the centre here today. Among the objectives of the centre to be is, is to be a focal point for the scholarly and public discussion of Australian constitutional law, and I feel so sure looking at today's registration list and at the speakers and the programs that we are in for a terrific discussion today. Our aim in this conference is to focus on what really matters in public law. And for that reason, we could not go past the rule of law as a theme for today's conference, given both the 70th anniversary of the Communist Party case and also the particular stresses arising in contemporary times. We obviously also needed to consider in detail the effect of the COVID pandemic. And we are really pleased that today has also provided an opportunity to celebrate the career of the Honourable Justice Nettle. I'm greatly looking forward to the final panel. I want to thank everybody here for attending, notwithstanding the online format. And I very much hope that when we meet again in two years to have this conference again, that we will do so in the traditional way, overcut, which will include cups of coffee and uh, meeting in person. But for the moment, it is wonderful to have you here virtually. And I would now like to hand over to my co-director, Jason Baruas, who will introduce the first session and the keynote address. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian. Um, so I'm Jason Vruhas, a professor at, at Melbourne Law School and with Professor Adrian Stone and director of the Law School Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies. Let me first uh, echo uh, Professor Stone's welcome. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this year's uh, CCCS conference. And it is, a great, it is great to see so many in attendance from across Australia and also um, from overseas. Now, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce the conference keynote address to be delivered by the Honourable Justice, Michelle Gordon. The keynote address is on the topic of the High Court of Australia's totemic decision in the Australian Communist Party case decided in 1951. Uh, it is a decision that stands uh, as a vindication of the rule of law. It has been described as an epochal decision. It's a staple inclusion in books on landmarks in Australian constitutional law. And on any view, it is firmly established as a part of the High Court's constitutional canon, to borrow an American phrase. This year marks the 70th anniversary of the High Court's decision. And we are delighted and honored to have Justice Gordon deliver the keynote address to mark this important anniversary. Justice Gordon was appointed to the High Court of Australia in June 2015, and since her appointment has delivered a series of important judgments in the fields of constitutional and public law. At the time of her appointment to the High Court, she was a judge of the Federal Court of Australia to which she was appointed in April 2007. Her honour graduated in law from the University of Western Australia, and she was admitted to practice in Western Australia in 1987 and joined the Victorian Bar in 1992. She was appointed senior counsel in 2003, and she practised in state and federal courts, principally in commercial equity, taxation, and general civil matters. Justice Gordon was appointed a professorial fellow of the Melbourne Law School 
in July 2015, where she has taught since 1999. It is a great pleasure to welcome Justice Gordon to deliver the conference keynote address titled The Communist Party Case, Core Themes and Legacy. Justice Gordon. It's an honour to have been asked to deliver the keynote address on the core themes and legacy of the Communist Party case, and I thank Dr. Verus for his introduction. The 70 years that have passed since the decision was handed down provide an opportunity for reflection. It's frequently cited by the High Court and lower courts across a range of issues. Constitutional law te textbooks are replete with references to principles applied and developed in the case. It's been hailed as one of the greatest triumphs of Australian constitutionalism, perhaps the most revered of the High Court's constitutional decisions. And I think rightly so. Today, we look back with all the benefits of hindsight to explore the legacy of the case, to examine its impacts and to assess the principles and themes emerging from it and how they've played out. When we do that, we see that the Communist Party case was and I think its legacy remains not only doctrinally fundamental to Australian constitutional law, but also politically and symbolically critical to what has long been and must remain a shared understanding of the system of government established by the constitution. But before developing these, these ideas, let me first make an obvious point. Many significant changes have taken place in the Australian legal system in the 70 years since it was decided new constitutional principles, implications and approaches to constitutional interpretation have been recognised. Statute law has dramatically increased. There have been expansions in the scope of various Commonwealth legislative powers, major developments in relation to executive power, a significant expansion and diversification of the statutory powers conferred on the executive in our modern regulatory state, as well as an expanding use of non-statutory executive power. More generally, the complexities of modern government have posed le novel legal issues and presented new challenges. Yet despite all these changes, the legacy of the case has endured. In essence, I think because it turned on fundamental and immutable principles on which our constitution is based. First, that the High Court is the ultimate custodian of the constitution. And second, that the Commonwealth Parliament cannot enact legislation that falls outside of the powers conferred on it under the Constitution, principles which give effect to and protect the rule of law. I'm going to keep my discussion of the background context brief. Most of you are familiar with the facts of the case and the social and historical context in which it arose. But I don't think the themes and legacy of the case can be properly understood without mentioning a few contextual matters. The late 1940s and early 50s were characterised by public fear of and hostility towards communism, both in Australia and around the world. A Menzies-led Liberal and Country Party coalition government had won the December 1949 election on a platform which included a promise to ban the Australian Communist Party. The implementation of that promise was the genesis of the Communist Party case. On the 27th of April 1950, Prime Minister Menzies introduced the Communist Party Dissolution Bill in the House of Representatives. In his second reading speech, Menzies said that while the bill was admittedly novel and far reaching, it was, and I quote, in a most special and important sense, a law relating to the safety and defence of Australia to deal with the King's enemies in this country. Following the introduction of the bill, the then leader of the opposition, the Honourable Ben Chifley, somewhat reluctantly confirmed that the Labor Party wouldn't oppose the bill, given the government had a mandate to implement its election promise. Chifley made clear the Labor Party would pursue amendments to the bill, or at least aspects of it, which they regarded as a complete negation of the principles of human justice and liberty. The bill was hotly debated in Parliament for months. The Senate, controlled by the Labor Party, passed various amendments to the bill, but the House of Representatives rejected the bill passed in the form by the Senate. And the bill was laid aside on the 23rd of June, 1950. Two days later, the Korean War broke out. 
and by September 1950, an Australian Army contingent, as well as 77 Squadron Royal Australian Air Force and nine ships of the Royal Australian Navy, were in Korea fighting with UN forces. On the 28th of September 1950, Menzies reintroduced the bill into the House of Representatives. It was in terms identical to those when it left the House of Representatives last. Menzies urged that the people of Australia by an overwhelming majority demanded this legislation and insist that it be placed on the statute book. He asked rhetorically, does anyone really believe that at a time when Australians are fighting and dying in a war against aggressive communism overseas, we in Australia should be so spineless as to leave the aggressive communist agents at home free to do their work? The bill was passed by both Houses of Parliament without amendment in October 1950 and the Communist Party Dissolution Act of 1950 commenced on 20 October. An important feature of the Act was its preamble, which as we all know contained nine recitals. The first three simply referred to the constitutional powers the Commonwealth was relying upon to deal with the Communists. 51.6, the defence power, 61, the executive power, and 5139, the incidental power. The next five recitals contained what Menzies described as the case against the communists, or as he put it in the House of Representative, the counts in the indictment, based on allegations of facts which were said to justify the government's action and establish a state of affairs both menacing and alarming and one which no democratic parliament could ignore. Among other things, these recitals asserted that the Communist Party engaged in espionage, sabotage and treason and engaged in violent activities designed to bring about a revolutionary overthrow or dislocation of the established system of government of Australia, including by disrupting production and work in vital industries to the security and defence of Australia. The final recital effectively stated that, stated that the operative provisions of the Act were necessary for the security and defence of Australia, the execution or maintenance of the constitution or Commonwealth laws. The operative provisions did three things. First, the Australian Communist Party was declared to be an unlawful association and by force of the act, it was dissolved. Second, the Governor General was authorised to declare a body of persons possessing commun communist affiliations or connections to be an unlawful association, if he was satisfied that the continued existence of that body would be prejudicial to security and defence of the Commonwealth, execution or maintenance of the constitution or Commonwealth laws. And bodies declared unlawful associations were also dissolved. Third, the Governor General was authorised to declare that a person was a member or officer of the Australian Communist Party or was a communist if he was satisfied that the person was engaged or was likely to engage in activities prejudicial to the same things, the security and defence of the Commonwealth, the execution or maintenance of the constitution or Commonwealth laws. Among other things, a person subject to such a declaration was incapable of holding office or being employed by the Commonwealth, couldn't hold an office in an industrial organisation, a trade union. If the Governor General declared that the trade union had a substantial number of members engaged in identified vital industries or in any industry the Governor General considered was vital to the security and defence of Australia. Significantly, I think, a body declared to be an unlawful association or an individual declared to be a communist by the Governor General was only entitled to apply to a court to set aside that declaration on the ground that they didn't possess any of the defined forms of connection or affiliation with the Communist Party or communism. There was no scope for review of the Governor General's satisfaction that the body or the activities of the individual would be prejudicial to security and defence or the execution and maintenance of the Constitution or Commonwealth laws. Just hours after the Act received royal assent, the Australian Communist Party, certain members of the Communist Party, a number of trade unions and certain union officials commenced proceedings in the original jurisdiction of the High Court, challenging the Act or the validity of the Act 
on grounds that it was outside the scope of Commonwealth legislative power and it wasn't brought within power by the statements in the preamble and that it was contrary to chapter three by usurping the judicial power of the Commonwealth and it infringed certain other constitutional limitations. Case was heard by the full court of the High Court by way of a case stated. It commenced on 14 November 1950 and the hearing lasted 24 days. 10 silks and 12 junior counsel were involved, many of whom went on to become judges of the High Court and State Supreme Courts. And one, Dr. Ebert, the then deputy leader of the Labor Party and a former judge of the High Court, appeared as counsel for two of the trade unions. On 9th March 1951, the six member majority, Justices Dixon, McTiernan, Williams, Webb, Fulliger and Kitto, each writing separately, held the act, act invalid. Chief Justice Latham was the sole dissentient. There were two questions of the law that had been stated for the opinion of the full court. The first essentially asked whether the validity of the act depended upon a judicial determination or ascertainment of the facts stated in the recitals. A majority of the court held it didn't. The second asked whether the act was invalid either in whole or in part. And the majority answered yes, the act was wholly invalid. The case was momentous and its legacy threefold. It is a landmark decision in terms of its political, doctrinal and symbolic impacts. I want to start with the political impacts. In reviewing the court's archival material on the Communist Party case, one thing jumped out at me as rather revealing of the political climate of the time was a letter to the district registrar of the High Court relating to an incident that had taken place during the hearing where the steps of the High Court were defaced with the slogan, repeat fascist laws, repeal fascist laws, the people want peace. It reflected, I think, the unusually high level of public interest and engagement about the issues before the court. Not only many members of the legal profession, but also the public had eagerly awaited the court's decision. And once delivered, the case had immediate political impact. While both the government and the opposition agreed that the justices of the High Court were not influenced by political considerations, the political significance of the decision was undoubtedly great. Four days after the decision was handed down, Prime Minister Menzies made a statement to the House of Representatives. He said that while he had no legal criticisms to make of the court's decision, he said, and I quote, it would be foolish to pretend that the decision had not given grave concern to the government and to millions of the Australian people. He said the government was considering whether any new and adequate constitutional power to deal directly with the communist wreckers could be obtained, either by referred powers from the states or by direct constitutional amendment approved by people at a refer referendum. As we know, both avenues were pursued without success. I want to make two points relating to the political circumstances around the case. The first is, is that the outcome came as a surprise to the government of the day. It's since been described as a slap on the face for the government, a rebuff that hadn't been expected. As Professor George Williams has observed, Chief Justice Latham's passionate dissent in the case probably produced the result expected to emerge that the act would be held valid given the enormous political and community pressures upon the court to uphold the act. The political climate in Australia was firmly against communism. Five of the seven justices that determined the case had been appointed by conservative governments. And while the majority's reasoning on why the act was not supported by the defence power attributed significance to the fact that the case was decided during peacetime, I think it must be borne in mind that the decision was down, handed down at the height of the Cold War and in the context of Australia's involvement in the Korean War. To say it was a time of great international tension would be putting it mildly. While the outcome may have been expected, unexpected politically, the case ultimately turned on the application of basic and fundamental legal principles and values, none of which were especially novel and some of which I'll return to shortly. The second point concerns what was really the key theme underpinning Chief Justice Latham's dissent, 
that matters of national security and the defense of the nation are matters for parliament and not the courts. His honor considered that it was necessary for parliament to have the decisive power to determine whether Australia is for communism or against communism and to legislate in accordance with its decision, unrestrained by whether or not a court agrees. That view was rejected by the majority. The case serves, I think, as a reminder that it is not correct to say that courts have nothing to do with policy or politics. It must be recalled the constitution itself is a political instrument dealing with government and governmental powers. Many issues arising under the constitution have a political dimension, at least in a general sense. As Justices Gummo and Crennan remarked in Thomas and Mowbray, where legislation is designed to affect a policy and the courts then are called upon to interpret and apply that law, inevitably consideration of that policy cannot be excluded from the curial interpretive process. Not infrequently, the court is called upon to exercise its functions of maintaining and enforcing the boundaries within which governmental power is exercised in a politically headed environment. I'll return to the significance of this shortly, but my point is simple. None of these political matters or dimensions releases the court from its duty to perform its constitutional function. Can I turn then to the doctrinal and jurisprudential impacts of the case, which have been the subject of great interest for constitutional lawyers and academics for decades. I should say that upon accepting the invitation to deliver this address, I found myself in the unenviable position of having agreed to speak to the legacy of a case which has captured the attention of many minds. Much ink has been spilled analysing it. And the task ahead of me became no less daunting by embarking upon a review of the authorities citing and considering the case. On my count, there are 133 decisions of the High Court alone. My review of those cases revealed that leaving aside the justices that, the, that decided the Communist Party case, it has been cited by all but four of the subsequent 36 justices appointed to the court and been cited in support of many and varied propositions and principles relating to the separation of powers, various legislative powers, executive powers, subordinate legislation, general principles of constitutional interpretation, judicial notice of facts, freedom of association, just to name a few. It goes without saying that today I do not intend to, and nor could I, undertake a comprehensive survey of the influence of the case in relation to the spectrum of issues and principles it's touched. My much narrower focus is on three broad themes that emerge when one examines the principles and propositions in respect to which the case is, I think, most frequently cited. These are the High Court's role as custodian of the Constitution, the scope of Commonwealth legislative powers, and the rule of law. Can I turn to address these themes? At its heart, the case concerned the balance to be struck between the High Court's role as the custodian of the Constitution and the scope of the legislative powers of the Commonwealth. The central thread or theme running through it is that it is the High Court's fundamental duty to determine, maintain and enforce the limits of governmental power. It is, as Professor Ross Anderson put it, a striking example of the court's determination to guard its position as watchdog of the Constitution. Justice Fulliger observed in the frequently quoted passage in the case that in our Australian system, the principle of Marbury and Madison is accepted as axiomatic. I doubt many of us would need reminding that in Marbury and Madison, Chief Justice Marshall of the United States Supreme Court famously remarked that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. That's to say, it's the courts, not the legislature, that are the custodians of the constitution. And it's therefore the courts that have final responsibility for deciding whether legislation is valid. And while it was never doubted that the High Court was to be the final arbiter of the constitution, there could be no doubt about the matter after the Communist Party case. The majority confirmed the importance of the court's review function, cementing it in stone, a role which has, and the importance of it, which has been repeated, repeatedly reaffirmed since. The High Court has also adopted an equivalent approach to explain the court's role in the judicial review of administrative action 
entrenched by section 75.5 of the constitution. There is, as Dr. Lisa Burton Crawford has explained, a clear and important symmetry between the court's constitutional and administrative review functions. The flip side of the court's role as arbiter of the constitution is that neither parliament nor the executive has the power to foreclose the court from determining any matter of fact or law on which constitutional validity depends. These limits on legislative and executive powers are necessary to ensure the efficacy of the court's role. And there are, I think, two related principles examined in the case relevant to that matter. The first, described by Justice Fuller as an elementary rule of constitutional law, is captured by that maxim that a stream cannot rise higher than its source. This is, as Professor George Winterton has remarked, undoubtedly the central doctrinal legacy of the case. It is underpinned by the idea that the powers of the parliament and the executive are sourced in the constitution. It follows that the parliament cannot conclusively determine whether a law is within constitutional power. Put in different terms, it can't recite itself into a power. The famous example given by Justice Fulliger was that, as we know, a power to make laws with respect to lighthouses does not authorise the making of a law with respect to anything which is, in the opinion of the lawmaker, a lighthouse. Rather, it's a power to make a law about what a court determines to be a lighthouse. Equally, no law may confer upon a body or person other than a court the power to determine conclusively any issue on which the constitutional validity of the law depends. And nor can a law confer a discretion on the executive, which entails complete freedom from legal control. If the discretion is capable of being exercised for purposes or given an operation, which would or might go outside the power from which the law conferring the discretion derives its force. The stream and source doctrine predate, predated the Communist Party case, but the majority judgments firmly reinforced the doctrine and provided clarity as to its operation. The majority held that Parliament could not recite itself into power by simply asserting that an identified threat to the security of the Commonwealth existed and that particular steps were necessary to protect Australia from the asserted threat, as it had purported to do in the preamble. The preamble couldn't be treated as decisive of establishing the requisite connection between the Act and the Commonwealth's legislative power. And while the plain intention of the Act was that the Governor-General was to have an unfettered administrative discretion to decide whether the existence of a body or the activities of an individual will be prejudicial to the security and defence of the Commonwealth, that opinion couldn't supply the only link between the defence power and the legal effect of the opinion except perhaps during times of war or emergency. The stream and source doctrine has been applied and endorsed in a variety of contexts since, sometimes without even explicitly referring to the Communist Party case. But I don't think it's been the subject of in-depth examination since the Communist Party case was decided. Can I take three examples to illustrate not only the range of emanations and influences of the doctrine, but that its operation in some contexts has been the subject of differing views even recently. First, the aliens power in 5119 of the constitution. As we know in 1982 in Pochi, Chief Justice Gibbs observed in a frequently cited passage that parliament cannot simply by giving its own definition of alien, expand the power under 5119 to include persons who couldn't possibly answer the description of aliens in the ordinary understanding of the word. Put differently, as Justices Gummo, Hayne and Hayden explained in Singh, a power to make laws with respect to aliens doesn't authorise the making of a law with respect to any person who, in the opinion of parliament, is an alien. As the recent case of Love on the Commonwealth demonstrates, although this core operation of the stream and source doctrine is not subject to any doubt, there remains a divergence of views as to the precise consequences of the limitation insofar as it concerns the extent to which Parliament is capable of defining the limit of the aliens' power, particularly by using statutory citizenship to identify who are members 
of the Australian community. The second example is executive detention. While the court in 2017 said in M96A that Parliament cannot avoid judicial scrutiny of the legality of detention by making the length of detention at any time depend upon the unconstrained and unascertainable opinion of the executive, there have been differing views about the precise operation of the stream and source doctrine in this context over several decades, al Kafaji and al Kateb, to name just two cases. The court's recent decision in Commonwealth and AJL 20 evidences that differences of opinion remain about the extent of executive discretion to determine the location of the boundary line between lawful and unlawful detention. And the third and final example, I think, is delegated legislative powers. In plaintiff S157, the Commonwealth made a submission to the effect that Parliament could validly delegate to the minister the power to exercise a totally open-ended discretion as to what aliens can and what aliens cannot come to and stay in Australia, subject only to the High Court deciding the constitutional fact of alien status. Commonwealth further submitted that the Challenged Act, which if we all know contained a privative clause to exclude judicial review of certain migration decisions, could be redrafted to say in effect, here are some non-binding guidelines which should be applied with the guidelines being the balance of the statute. Significantly, I think the court rejected these submissions, emphasising that although Parliament has wide power to authorise subordinate legislation, what may be delegated is the power to make laws with respect to a particular head of legislative power in section 51 of the constitution. The court expressly noted that legislation of the kind suggested by the Commonwealth conferring a wholly open-ended discretion on the executive, may fail to disclose a significant connection to a head of power if there will be delineated by parliament no factual requirements to connect any given state of affairs with that constitutional head of power. The court in plaintiff S157 also foreshadowed that the provisions of the kind canvassed by the Commonwealth would appear to lack the hallmark of the exercise of legislative power, namely the determination of the content of, the, of a law as a rule of conduct or a declaration as to power, right or duty. Again, I do not think these limitations have yet been the subject of any extensive consideration by the court. Those three examples are not exhaustive, but they demonstrate that although the stream and source doctrine is well established and its significance enduring, there remains some uncertainty about the meets and bounds of its operation, or at least its application in some areas. The second principle is that it's a necessary corollary of the court's review function is as Justice Williams put it in the Communist Party case, that it is the duty of the court in every constitutional case to be satisfied of every fact, the existence of which is necessary in law to provide a constitutional basis for the legislation. The facts that must be determined by the court to determine the validity of a law constitutionally are known as constitutional facts. There are species of legislative facts and they are distinct from ordinary questions of adjudicative fact which arise between parties to a case. The Communist Party case has been described as the centrepiece of the modern Australian theory of constitutional fact. That is correct at the level of principle namely it's the duty of the court to be satisfied of constitutional facts. But the majority in the case took the view that matters of constitutional fact were to be determined in accordance with the rules of evidence, which permitted facts to be taken on judicial notice. That view has not prevailed. Instead, I think a more flexible approach to ascertaining constitutional facts has been developed in a number of subsequent cases, essentially based upon the recognition that the court must find constitutional facts as best it can and that constitutional validity cannot be made to depend upon the conduct of parties to private litigation. There's much that has been and could be said about constitutional fact finding. Reliance on statistics as constitutional facts, for example, may present particular challenges. This is something that remains relatively unexplored, but which in our increasingly statistical world will no doubt be apparent. But that's just one example. 
the use of empirical studies and more generally reliance on expert evidence present their own challenges. For present purposes, I'll confine myself to making the point that the court's duty to be satisfied of the existence of constitutional facts has significant practical implications for the conduct of constitutional litigation in the modern world. Constitutional facts are particularly important, as we know, in determining where the purpose of powers, like the defence power and the external affairs power are engaged, whether a law burdens the freedom guaranteed by section 92 or infringes the implied freedom of political communication. Put bluntly, constitutional cases may be won or lost on the facts, as the court's recent decision in Unions New South Wales demonstrated. My short point is that constitutional facts are important and after 70 years, we still don't seem to understand their practical importance in the conduct of constitutional litigation and in the court's deliberation of the case before it. The old age that facts win cases is as true as it was today as it was 70 years ago and they need better and I think more considered attention. The second broad theme to be addressed concerns the scope of Commonwealth legislative powers and the fundamental principle that the Commonwealth Parliament can't enact legislation that falls outside of the powers conferred on it under the Constitution. As we know, the powers relied upon by the Commonwealth to support the validity of the Commonwealth Dissolution Act were the defence power under 51.6 and the power to make laws for the protection of the Commonwealth against subversive designs derived either from a combination of 5139, the incidental power and section 61, the executive power, or from what is now commonly known as the implied nationhood power. The majority held that regardless of the truth or falsity of the facts asserted in the recitals, neither power supported the validity of the act. And so it was invalid. Can I deal with the defense power first? In relation to that power, the majority held that because the only links between the act and defence were parliament's opinion as to the threat posed by the communist party and the governor general's opinion as to the threat posed by affiliated bodies and individual communists, the act wasn't within power. And while the preamble referred to activities and operations which in the opinion of parliament were pursued by the Australian communist party, its offers, members and other communists, the condition of the application of the act to the communist party or any association or person was merely that it was communist or had communist associations. And the connection of the act with legislative power depended upon the aims and objects which communism implies rather than upon the action of the party or of its allies or of individuals. Two features of that reasoning are of particular relevance. First, the majority treated the case as one arising during what was ostensibly peacetime even though, as I've described, Australian forces were engaged in hostilities in Korea at the time. They drew a distinction between the scope of the defence power during times of relative peace and times of war or uneasy peace. A number of the justices suggested that measures of the kind enacted might have been valid if Australia had been fully at war in a period of grave emergency or preparing for an imminent war. The second, and I think related point is that the majority's reasoning seems to have been premised on the view that the defence power was centrally concerned with the protection of the nation from external threats, that is, external enemies acting within Australia, a view expressed explicitly by Justices Dixon and Fulliger. And it remained the dominant view for over 50 years. Generally speaking, responsibility for dealing with threats arising internally in matters of domestic civil order were thought to rest with the states and their police forces, while the power to deal with internal threats to the Commonwealth government was understood to derive from the Commonwealth's power to protect itself, for example, from treason or sedition, derived from the combination of the incidental power and the executive power, or the implied nationhood power. It would be fair to say, I think, that the majority's reasoning regarding the defence power hasn't prevailed, particularly since Thomas and Malbray, the court's taken an expansive view of the scope of the defence power, which bears little resemblance to that adopted by the majority in the Communist Party case. 
As we know, in Thomas and Mowbray, a majority of the High Court upheld the validity of a Commonwealth law that gave federal courts power to issue control orders as preventative measures to protect against terrorist acts. A key issue in Thomas was whether the defence power only supported legislation directed at external threats to the Australian body politic from other nations. The whole court, including Justice Kirby in dissent, held that the defence power extended to dealing with threats posed by non-state actors. Chief Justice Gleeson and Justices Gummo, Crennan and Hayden also held that the defence power extended to protecting against internal threats posed to the public at large. That is to protect the citizens or inhabitants of the Commonwealth and the states and their property. The majority's reasoning in Thomas is I think broadly consistent with Chief Justice Latham's view in dissent in the Communist Party case that the defence power extends to defence against internal enemies and against real or suspected internal agents or supporters of actual or potential external enemies. Justices Hayne and Callanan specifically questioned the appropriateness of maintaining the sharp distinction between the scope of the defence power during times of war and peace that was identified by the majority in the Communist Party case. In dissent, Justice Kirby didn't hold back in his criticism of the majority's decision. He said he had not expected during his service, and I quote, to see the Communist Party case sidelined, minimised, doubted, or even criticised and denigrated in this court. His Honour added that given the majority's reasoning, it appeared likely that had the Dissolution Act been challenged on that day, its constitutional validity would have been upheld. Whether that is so is a question for another day. But recently in private R in Cowan, a majority of the court again took an expansive approach to the scope of the defence power during peacetime. The majority held that a provision which relevantly provided that a member of the defence force committed an offence against the Defence Force Discipline Act, if they engaged in conduct which would have constituted an offence against the German criminal law, was supported by the defence power. The plurality, Chief Justice Kiefel and Justices Bell and Keane, accepted the Commonwealth's argument that the law is within the scope of the defence power if it's reasonably necessary for the good order and discipline of the Australian Defence Force. Why? Because their honours took the view that such a law is reasonably necessary to the defence of the nation and that it was irrelevant that civil courts could hear and determine similar charges. By contrast, Justice Nettle and myself held that the defence power supported the provision in its application to the specific charges laid against the plaintiff, which involved violence, because there was a sufficient connection between those charges and maintaining and enforcing the good order and discipline of the defence force. Why? Because violence is inconsistent with or inimical to a disciplined service. But each of us held that some forms of conduct prescribed by the ordinary criminal law fell outside of the defence power. Clearly a more expansive view of the defence power has prevailed since the Communist Party case. But again, its scope remains not clearly defined. The legacy of the Communist Party case is I think more mixed in relation to the other power relied upon by the Commonwealth. The power to make laws for the protection of the Commonwealth against subversive designs. The majority accepted the Commonwealth had a such a power although there were differing approaches as to the source of it. I describe the legacy as mixed because on the one hand, given the expansive approach to the defence power that has been adopted at least since Thomas and Mowbray, any separate power to make laws for the protection of the Commonwealth will seem to have a relatively confined operation. On the other hand, Justice Dixon's reasoning in relation to the existence of an implied power derived from the Commonwealth status as a polity has evidently influenced the High Court's evolving jurisprudence with respect to the concept of nationhood as a source of power. And it's this aspect of the legacy I want to briefly consider now. The idea that there are certain inherent powers derived from Australian nationhood, not dependent upon any express grant of legislative power in either sections 51 and 52 of the Constitution, had been foreshadowed in earlier decisions of the Court before Communist Party was decided. Two streams of authority have begun to emerge. One concerned 
with an implied power to protect the Commonwealth from internal insurrection. The other, concerned with the Commonwealth's power to foster and advance the polity with initiatives undertaken for the benefit of its people, a kind of utopian implied legislative nation building power. The former stream of authority, an implied legislative power which is protectionist, was crystallised by Justice Dixon in the Communist Party case. His Honour held that Parliament's power to legislate against subversion or seditious courses of conduct and utterances has a source in principle that is deeper or wider than a series of combination of the words in 5139 with other, with other constitutional powers could produce. It was, he said, a power derived from the establishment and character of the national polity. A number of judges have subsequently endorsed the view that the Commonwealth has an implied desert of power based on nationhood. But the scope and nature of such a power has not been authoritatively determined. The extent to which nationhood provides an independent source of Commonwealth legislative power, as well as the scope of the power remains unsettled. So Justice Dixon's legacy here concerning the existence of inherited, inherent legislative power is I think qualified. But the aspects of his honours reasoning have however, I think, contributed to and influence the development of some inherent executive power based on the same notions of nationhood. In an influential passage of the AAP case in 1975, after referring to Justice Dixon's decision in the Communist Party case, Justice Mason stated, and I quote, there is to be deduced from the existence and character of the Commonwealth as a national government and from the presence of 5139 and 61, a capacity to engage in enterprises and activities peculiarly adapted to the government of a nation and which cannot otherwise be carried on for the benefit of the nation. Other justices in the AAP case also recognize the existence of an implied nationhood power and the notion has been endorsed and developed by a number of justices in subsequent cases. Chief Justice Mason and Justices Dean and Gordon in Davis and the Commonwealth and Justices Gummo, Crennan and Bell in Pape and the Federal Commissioner of Taxation. And that reliance on the implied nationhood power to support activities of the executive and Commonwealth spending continues even in 2021 one need only look at a large number of explanatory statements to regulations amending the Financial Framework Supplementary Powers Regulations of the Commonwealth of 1997. But the existence of such a power has been the subject of considerable criticism, both by a number of justices and the Academy, and there remain important questions about its scope. For present purposes, it's sufficient to make one short point. Whatever is to be the future of the implied executive power derived from the character and status of the national polity, particularly the so-called nation building power, I think it should be kept in mind that when Justice Dixon identified an implied legislative power to deal with threats to the existence of the Commonwealth in the Communist Party case, he did so in the context of warning of the dangers of unbridled executive power. His Honour stated, history and not only ancient, ancient history shows that in countries where democratic institutions have been unconstitutionally superseded, it has been done not seldom by those holding the executive power. Forms of government may need protection from dangers likely to arise from within the institutions to be protected. I then shift and move to the final and probably most prominent theme of the Communist Party case, the rule of law. Justice Dixon famously described the rule of law as an assumption on which the constitution was framed. And although the phrase rule of law was only used that one time in the 156 pages of the reported decision, the Communist Party case has been hailed a celebrated victory for the rule of law a powerful example of the rule of law at work and the classic case protecting the rule of law in Australia. My review of the cases citing the Communist Party case revealed that it is the most frequently cited in relation to propositions about the rule of law. 
Professor Winterton has observed that the rule of law aspect of the decision holds symbolic importance, and I tend to agree. In striking down the Challenge Act, the High Court confirmed and reinforced its position as the independent arbiter of the exercise of government power by the parliament and executive. It is the clearest example in our constitutional history of the court positively asserting its constitutional function, a function which is critical for the protection of the rule of law. However the rule of law is to be defined, there is no doubt about its irreducible minimum, that government should be under law. But of course, there are law limits to the court's ability to uphold and give effect to the rule of law. Ultimately, subject to the limits on legislative and executive powers, it is for parliament and the executive to choose whether to promote or diminish the rule of law. And because of its nature as a court, the power of the court is reactive and contingent. What do I mean? The power of the court's only exercise when a case is brought and the applicant is standing to seek relief. These limits make it all the more important that when a case is brought in which the parliament or executive have stepped outside the scope of their powers, they be directly and decisively held to account. There is little point lamenting on the importance of the rule of law and engaging in rhetoric about the importance of the court's role as custodian of the constitution, unless those principles inform and direct the everyday work of the court. May I make two related observations? First, the High Court's ability to independently and impartially uphold the limits on the exercise of legislative and executive power, even in the most politically sensitive cases, like the Communist Party case, is perhaps the clearest indicator of the effectiveness and success of the institution itself. It bears repeating Justice Kirby's observations in Farden that as the High Court demonstrated in the Communist Party case, the court's function responds to a time frame that's much longer than that of the other branches of government. Inevitably, it affords a constitutional corrective to transient passion, passions and sometimes to ill-considered laws repugnant to the timeless constitutional design. Or as Chief Justice French said in Titani, the strength of the protections for which the constitution provides cannot be made to fluctuate according to public opinion polls. Inconvenient as it may be, at times it is necessary for the court to make tough and unpopular decisions that have significant political co consequences. As Justice Kirby put it in Roberts and Bass, inconvenience has never been a reason for refusing to give effect to the constitution. And if it had been, the Communist Party case among others would have been differently decided. Notwithstanding those facts and matters which are of critical importance, it's necessary for courts to pay close attention to the boundaries between the legislative and judicial functions and to exercise particular caution not to cross those boundaries when determining issues that concern political matters and policy judgments. The use of labels like judicial deference, restraint, margin appreciation are, I think, unhelpful. They are labels that tend to conceal more than they reveal. Any discussion of deference is fundamentally about the separation of legislative, executive and judicial power and the reciprocal need for each branch of government to keep out of the territory of the others. For present purposes, the key point is that courts recognise that some matters fall outside of their institutional responsibility and competence. But that recognition must not be blindly wielded, whether explicitly or otherwise, as a justification for judicial inaction, and nor should it be extended to the point that it obligates performance by the court of its fundamental constitutional duty. As was made clear by the majority in the Communist Party case, even in relation to matters of defence and national security, areas where courts typically afford great weight and respect to the views of Parliament and the executive, it remains the ultimate responsibility of the court to determine whether an exercise of governmental power is within constitutional limits. If the court shies away from performing that function, the rule of law is dealt a major blow. Equally, the court must avoid succumbing to pressures that would render it a tool or mechanism for achieving outcomes of political importance for any government of the day.
And this is not a uniquely Australian issue. Autocratic governments and strongman leadership have tested the strength of judiciaries around the world. The ability of an independent judiciary to enforce the rule of law continues to be tested to varying degrees in many countries. My second observation is that the changes that have taken place in the Australian legal system since the Communist Party case was decided, especially the increasing use of statute law, the expansion of statutory powers conferred on the executive, the expanding use of non-statutory executive power, and the challenges facing modern governments have only increased and not diminished the importance of safeguarding the court's role as constitutional watchdog. Now, more than ever, the court must remain vigilant and the legacy of the Communist Party must be borne firmly in mind. Legislation that would undermine or impair the court's role as custodian and arbiter of the constitution must be rejected. The court must exercise caution in the face of inevitable pressures to expand the scope of legislative powers, keeping in mind that the heads of legislative power are subjects of legislation not pegs on which the federal parliament may hang legislation on any subject that it likes. And they are matters of substance, not merely form. Indeed, in light of the Communist Party case, one would not expect parliament to ever be so overt again in assuming for itself powers that are irrevocably committed to judicial determination. The use of different drafting techniques, sometimes more subtle, but sometimes not, which have the potential to obfuscate a lack of connection with power or a contravention of a constitutional limitation has been and remains problematic. And the need for caution extends to executive assertions of self-defining and self-fulfilling powers, some of which are largely unchecked and incapable of being checked. Put in different terms, the problems which the court grappled with 70 years ago in the Communist Party case continue to arise, unabated and sometimes in new ways. At the start of this address, I said that the Communist Party case was legally, symbolically and politically important. Legally, symbolically and politically, the case emphasised the rule of law and the High Court's role in the Australian system of government. Whatever changes lie ahead, the rule of law must remain the fundamental, important, informing principle for the legislature, the executive and the judiciary in our shared system of government established by the Constitution. The 70th anniversary of the Communist Party case reminds us all that it remains the fundamental duty of the High Court at all times to give effect to that basal principle. Thank you. Let me conclude uh, the session. Uh, by once again thanking Justice Gordon for her excellent keynote address. Her address offered an enlightening and engaging account of the historical context of the Communist Party case and of the decision itself. She expertly unpacked and navigated the multiple legacies or afterlives of the case, including the case's political, doctrinal and symbolic legacies. Her address culminated uh, in an important reflection um, upon what the Communist Party case tells us about the constitutional role of the High Court of Australia, including its role in upholding very basic legal precepts. So thank you, Justice Gordon, for your keynote address, which is a fitting celebration of the 70th anniversary of the Communist Party case. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm very grateful.